was We worship the God who is We worship the God who evermore be He opened winds and doors He parted the raging sea My God, He holds the victory There's joy There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet Gonna shout out your praise Oh, shout out your praise Say that again, we worship the God who was We worship the God who was We worship the God who is We worship the God who evermore will be Opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in the We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who saves We sing to the God who always made the way Cause he hung up on that cross Then he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out of your grave There's joy in the house of the Lord this new song that we have been learning about where we stand now. You know what, with the grace of God on our lives, we can, God takes us from our old life into our new life. And I love that He redeems us, He restores us, He builds us up. And it, the Bible says that when you put your past behind you and God has a future for you. But also it means that even in your, in your life right now, He can take you from where you're standing in, in maybe sorrow, he can give you gladness. If you're standing in confusion, he can, you can now stand in His Word that will give you truth and direction. If you're standing in sickness, He will heal you and you can stand in wholeness and health. So wherever you're at, 
rejoice that He has restored you, that His grace has redeemed you, and He takes you out of darkness and into His light. So Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have done for us and how you have taken us out of the depths and put us on the rock, on the heights. In your precious and holy name, amen. Out of the wilderness to your deliverance, look where I'm standing now. These hands that once were chained, now lifted high in praise, look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain breaking Miracle making Powerful name of Jesus On the body you raise it Prodigal saving Powerful name of Jesus yeah. First verse again. Out of the wilderness to your deliverance, look where I'm standing now. These ends at once were chained, now lifted high in praise. Look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing.
Hold back. Here we go. Shame is prison, as cruel as a grave. Shame is a rival, and he's come to take my name. Lifting me up from the ground Love is a power When my freedom song is found from the grave. He's promised us new life and a future life with him. So church, thank you for joining us. We will see you very, very soon. 
Hey church, happy Palm Sunday. We're so happy to have you here. We just wanted to hop on and just say thank you so much for your continued support of the Foothills Church. We just know that God's going to continue to bless you in that area of your life. And we're just so grateful for the opportunity to give. Here are the announcements and Danny Milo is going to be reading scripture. Hi everybody, it's Pastor David. I am here at Los Animas Park and I'm reminding you that our Easter picnic is this Saturday. I know, you need to make sure it's marked on your calendar. We are so excited to have you here. And listen, it's just not gonna be as much fun if you are not here with us. Am I right or am I right or am I right? Right, right, right. Remember, this is for the entire family. We're gonna have a bounce house for the kids. We're gonna have so much food, it's gonna be awesome. And one of my favorite things, we're gonna have an Easter egg hunt for all of the kids and they just might get a chance to spot the Easter Bunny because I don't know if you know, but the Easter Bunny is a Christian and goes to church events. Also, I wanna make sure you know what we mean when we say the color war. You might be like, what is the color war? I don't think it means what you think it means. Anyone can play in the color war, even a bunch of little kids, so that's just a good reminder, please don't run over a little kid at the color war. We're all gonna be wearing white t-shirts. We're gonna have four barrels. Two of them are filled with red dye and two of them are filled with blue dye. This. So hopefully you've already signed up. You're either on Man Bat's team or you're on the One Arm Bandit's team. Basically, the two teams are gonna fight each other with the die, and we're gonna try to get the other team as colorful as possible using only this. And we're gonna have a president that we're gonna try to protect. And at the very end of the game, whoever's president has the most white shirt, they are declared the winner. But really, you're probably asking, am I going to be a whole different color by the time I'm done? The answer is yes. You get a chance to look like an Easter egg. And I suppose you're wondering what you can bring. We would love for you to bring for us a side dish and a dessert to share. That's really important because this is really a family picnic for all of us. You can also bring, if you want to, really comfortable folding chairs because we don't have really comfortable folding chairs at the church. Make it a full picnic. Get a blanket, get a spread. This is gonna be so much fun. We are excited. I hope you're excited. We'll see you this Saturday right here at Los Animas Park, 11 o'clock. I confess that on the road to Jerusalem, I don't know where in the crowd I might have stood. Did I throw my coat in honor or wave my palm branch in celebration? Did I lead the crowd in shouts of worship or stand in the back and just watch? I only know that your love chases and weeps. Your love celebrates, forgives, and walks the long road with me even when I leave you behind in the dust. Your love endures, not just the goodness, but also the pain and the mistakes. I cannot explain even a moment that I forsake the opportunity to worship you. But today, I fall on my knees. I lay down the coat of my shame and sin. I wave my palm branch of surrender. I declare that you are God. There is no other. And I watch you go down the road where I know you endured it all for me. Amen. Good morning, church. I'll be reading to you today from Psalms 16, 7 through 9. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Psalm 16, 7 through 9. Thanks, Danny. That was awesome. Now here's Pastor Mark with part three of No Guarantees But God. 
Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for watching today, staying a part of the of the uh, Foothills Church. We really appreciate your support and um, and just being involved. So we, we miss seeing you face to face. If you can come on a Sunday, that would be awesome. We'd love to see you again. A lot of people are starting to come back whom we haven't seen for a while. And it's just wonderful on Sundays. Um, this uh, next coming week is Easter and we will be having church at nine o'clock and then at 1030. So love to see you for Easter. If you can come out and come on into the building, love to have you. But thanks for staying a part of the Foothills Church. Let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Uh, Jesus, we call on you today uh, as John called you or you called yourself and John recorded it, the bread of heaven that has come down. And, and so, Lord, we, we trust you to, to deliver your word, to give us what we need to sustain our lives and, and to further our walk and our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, everything about a person, everything about me, for the most part, is a compi- I am a compilation of the words either written or spoken, the thoughts, the teaching of another person. My worldview, my personal view about myself, um, about my situation, my circumstances, it, it all comes from someone else. We are a product of others. That's just who we are. David acknowledges that, that he was a product of someone else. And he said, and, and you know, we're, we're talking this series from Psalms chapter 16 called No Guarantees, but God. And David found that he had guarantees from the Lord. And no matter what his circumstances were, and we've talked a couple weeks about the situations and circumstances of David's life, regardless of those, he still had God. He and God were good. Life was good, regardless of where he was, who he was with, or what he had or didn't have. So there's no guarantees, but God. And we're finding this out for ourselves through David's writings in Psalms chapter 16. And today we're going to be looking at verses 7 and 8, where David said this. First of all, we want to be in sync with God. And David was in sync with God. Here's what he said. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. David is acknowledging that it was the counsel of the Lord that had helped to shape and mold who he was as a person. And then he said this, even at night, my heart instructs me. Very interesting way to say things. But, But what we see here is that David, he's in sync with God's word and he's a, he's adhered to it, and so so now his heart and mind are in sync with what God is saying and teaching. And that's where where we all should want to be. I want my thoughts in sync with the Lord's Word. I want my feelings in sync with the Lord's Word. I want my actions to be in sync with God's Word. So David praised the Lord for all he had. Remember, he said, he said, you've made my lot secure. You've, you've given me my portion in my cup. And the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. So David's acknowledging that all he has or all that he had at that time was from God. And, and what God, because God was leading him. I'll praise the Lord who counsels me. His leadership, God's leadership of David's life was the reason that David thought the way he thought, felt the way he felt, and acted the way he acted. Through God's wise counsel, he was able to reach the right conclusions about his life. Through COVID, things were taken from us. Liberties, freedoms, finances, businesses, things were lost. And yet, we can, we can reach the right conclusions about life through COVID and that God is still sustaining us. Having the right conclusions 
comes from the right information. And so David's saying, God, you're the one who counsels me. I am who I am because of your word. God's word helped David sync up his faith. And what is your faith? Basically, your faith, it's your hopes of the future. It's what you are hoping for. And not hoping in, in the form of a wish, but hoping in the form of an expectation. Right? Faith is a substance of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for. What we expect God to do based on what God says. Once again, God's counsel. So God's word helped David to sync up his faith, what he believed, his hopes, with his situation. On the run from Saul, hiding, nothing, driven from his family, driven from his inheritance, lost his position as the commander of the armies, lost his wife. Remember, we talked about last week how Saul gave his wife to another person. But God's word, his counsel, helped David's faith and reality, his circumstances, what he was seeing, to be in sync with God and his word. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We live by faith, not by sight. You live by faith because you know God's word. Remember what David talk, Pastor David talked a few weeks ago about blind faith. We, we're not living by blind faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. So we live by what we know is true. That was what David was doing. And so his reality wasn't preferable, but he had such hope and faith in God. He was synced up with God. See, if what we believe and then see are in the right order, we have clarity and confidence. We have to have those two things. What we see, our circumstances, our situations, our reality, versus what we believe about God. They have to be in the right order if we're going to have clarity and confidence. The right order is we believe in God. We don't, we don't believe in, in what we see. Because God can change what we see and what we're living with, our reality, in, in, a, in a blink of an eye. But when our circumstances cloud our judgment, that's where fear sets in. In, in Psalms chapter 16, you read no evidence of fear in David. No evidence of fear that he has from King Saul. No evidence of fear that he won't be able to make it because his inheritance is gone. There's no fear in David of what he's going to eat or where he's going to sleep. There's nothing. There's just confidence in God because God had been counseling David all along. So David believed God's counsel and rested in him. I, I, I tell you, folks, that's where I want to be. This is one of the reasons why I love David so much. King David is one of my favorite people in the Bible. And, and it, partly because I read the Psalms every day, but, you know, it's just that, that, that hold on to God for all your worth mentality that David had. In spite of some of his sin and, and shortcomings and things that he had blind spots, you know, read about how he treated his kids and stuff. David had problems. He had faults. He had, he had struggles. But man, he just hung on to the Lord and he hung on to the Lord and no one could shake him. In fact, he even says that coming up. Uh, here's the thing about God's counsel. Here's the thing about any advice. You never know if, it's, if the advice is right unless you adhere to it. Somebody could tell you, you know, you could go to, you could go to a counselor and ask their opinion or ask their advice on your marriage. I had a guy come into my office once and he said, I really need to talk to you about my marriage. It's, it's, it's just a mess. And, and so he, he talked to me for a while about, about the mess he was in with his, with his wife and their struggles they were having. And he asked what he should do to fix it. I gave him some very simple advice. Here's some things that it's not going to change it immediately. Because you've got to remember, if you're in problems in a marriage, you didn't get there overnight. And you're not going to get out of them overnight, right? It's like 
It's like if you've, if you've put on weight, uh, it took some time to put the weight on. It's going to take some time to take the weight off. It doesn't just, oh, I went on a diet for two days and I, don't, I, I didn't lose much weight. Well, you weren't just eating for two days, right? So I told him it's going to take some time, but here's some steps that you can do that will put your marriage back on track. He never did them. I know he never did them because I would have seen him if he had. One of the things that I said, you and I need to talk about every week. Never called back. They divorced. It was a mess. Really bad. My advice, I think, would have, was the right advice. But because it wasn't adhered to, he'd never, he'll never know. He'll never know if those things had worked. If he'd have done what I had asked or what I had laid out before him, if I'd have, he could say, if I'd have done those things, it might, have, it might have worked. I may have saved my marriage. We'll never know. So this is how David came to praise the Lord. His counsel worked. <laughs> and David knew they worked because David did it. He did what God said. And if we do what the Lord says, we will find that his word actually works. That forgiving someone over a period of time, and it's like, you know, it's not a one-time thing usually when you forgive somebody. It, it's, it's a process. But over time, you realize the sting of it, the hurt of it, the memory of it fades and heals. And then you realize, I had all these bad things happen to me, yet I'm not a bitter person. That's because God's counsel works. But it only works if you do it. At some point, this is what I believe, at some point, David would have had to have asked God for his help in whatever situation or issue he was struggling or dealing with. And then, because the nature of God is to, is to help us, the nature of God, because he loves us so much, what good father wouldn't help their child if they came and asked for help, right? He's our father in heaven. He's not a good father. He's a great father. He's a perfect father. And so at some point, David would have had to ask for help. And God, being the good father that he was, would have spoke to David in a way he could understand. See, and that's the other thing about God. God will speak to us in ways that we can understand it's him. He doesn't tell us to do things we're incapable of, of even ascertaining what he's meaning. God can break it down into a simplest form. And so he must have spoke to, to David in a way that David could understand. And then David would have then had to have heed the advice to see the results. God is, God will give us advice, but he doesn't make us do it. He doesn't force us to do it. He gives us an opportunity. He gives us an option. And we can follow through with it. And then if we do, God is faithful to bring about the results. This is how it works for everyone. Not just David. David wasn't some special guy. God made him special. David said in Psalms uh, 18, you stoop down to make me great. So David was a great man, but not because he was David. David was a great man because he followed God's advice. He, he took God's word to heart and acted on it. And it's the same for us. It's the same principle. We ask God. He speaks. We hear and then do. And the results follow. It's the way it works for all of us. As we see positive results by putting into practice what God says. Remember what James says in James chapter, chapter 1. Don't just merely listen to the word. Do what it says. Do what it says. So as we do what God says, we put it into practice. Our level of understanding grows. And here's the thing that then happens. We start to teach or instruct ourselves because the truth is in us. So I could just see David laying his head down on a rock in a cave with a very small fire going, 
because he didn't, wouldn't, didn't want the smoke to, to, to be seen by Saul and his 300 warriors. But David telling himself, no, this is what God said. This is what God says. This is what God said to me here. This is what God said to me there. So don't, don't, don't worry about your circumstances right now because God is faithful. God is good. And I know that because I follow God, that I'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. And that one day uh, I, will, I, I will prosper in everything that I do. And so he started teaching himself because of what he knew. But listen, you really don't know God's word until you start to put his word to practice in your life. Otherwise, it's just a theory not an experience. You start to understand and teach yourself what is true or effective or what is false or ineffective for your life. Here's what David said in Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. He delights in the law of the Lord. Now, he's talking about the man, he says in verse 1, blessed is he who doesn't, who doesn't, Stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of uh, or, 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 or walk with the ungodly, sit in the seat of the ungodly or, or sit in the seat of mockers. Right. I kind of messed that word up. But Psalms one, you can open up your Bible and read it. Right. And then he goes on to say, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is not in the counsel. Of the wicked. His delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night. The meditating is to reflect over and over, to, to, to think about it and think about it and think about it and repeat it and speak it over and over to yourself. Even at night, my heart counsels me. So when we're in sync with God's word, as David is clearly here, we're in sync with God's word to the point that we're even teaching ourselves what God says. We're instructing ourselves. Now we're in step with God. When we're in sync, we're in line, aligned, you know, head, heart with God, then we're, we're, we're walking with him. That's what it means to walk with the Lord. And here's what David says. He goes on to say, I have set the Lord always before me, always before me. And because he's at my right hand, I'll not be shaken. How did David set the Lord always before him? What's... What's the process of this? What do you do? I mean, do you just say it? Well, God's, God's going before me. What does this mean? It's, it's an act. It's an action. And the act of setting the Lord before you means you align yourself with him. You link with him. Amos asked this question. How can two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? So there has to be this aligning with God. God is going this way. If you're going to walk with God, then you have to walk with him. He doesn't necessarily walk with you. You walk with him, right? So it's aligning yourself or linking your life with the Lord's. And then it's adjusting your thoughts, adjusting your feelings, adjusting your actions to his will according to his will. Even Jesus did this in the garden. He famously said these words, not my will, but yours be done. God, I'm adjusting my feelings about going to the cross. I'm adjusting me to you. I am not asking you to adjust to my feelings or my thoughts about this. Because Isaiah tells us in Isaiah... The book of Isaiah, that God's word and his ways, his thoughts are higher than ours, right? I believe it's Isaiah 55. God's, God's ways are higher than our ways. We adjust to him. He doesn't adjust to us. So the act of setting the Lord always before you, align with him by linking your life with his, walking with him, adjusting to his will, and then availing yourself to him. You sit before him, you wait on him. I have to avail myself to the Lord every day. I have to avail myself to the Lord when I read my word, his word, my Bible. I adjust, or I mean, I avail myself to God to let him speak to me. 
when I pray for help, when I, when I ask him a question, I have to then listen and I have to look for the answer, availing ourselves to him. That's the act of, of setting the Lord always before you. And this is what David did. But we can't just say it. We have to do it. We have to do it. It's in the doing that comes the knowing. I'm going to say that again. It's in the doing that comes the knowing. So we either set the Lord before us, as David did, as I'm attempting to do with my life, and as I, I'm sure many of you are, or we shut him out. We shut him out by lack of action. The, the young man that came to me about his marriage that was in a mess, I gave him some very simple things to do where he could have aligned himself and adjusted himself and availed himself to the Lord about his marriage. He could have aligned the Lord in his thoughts and his, and his actions and adjusted some things and availed himself to the Lord. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. And so his lack of action shut God out of the process of his marriage and it fell apart. It's true with our finances. It's true with us as parents. We can listen to how the world says to raise our kids. Or we can find out what the Lord says about raising our kids. If we choose the way of the world, as far as our finances are concerned, or, or our children are concerned, or our marriage is concerned, how we feel about things, how we see our world, if we follow the world's perspective, what we're essentially doing is shutting the Lord out. So now the Lord isn't before us. Other people's words, cultures before us. Very dangerous. There's a lot at stake. Why are we talking about this? Because you're important. Your life is important. The trajectory of your life is very important to God and should be very important to you. And so the decisions you make are going to be based off what you're listening to, who you're listening to. When we don't follow the Lord's word, we're essentially shutting him out of the process. But because David set the Lord before him, here's the next thing. He was right there by his side. So you got God always before him and right by his side. But God's omnipresent, so that's no problem for God. God could be before David, and he could always be, and he also could be right by his side. So with the Lord before him to lead and to guide, and then at his right hand. And why the right hand? The right hand in the Bible, the right was always the symbol of power. So David's at his, the Lord's at David's right hand, which is the alpha position where God is belongs in every one of our lives, the alpha position, before us and at our right, our strength. As his partner, God was partnering with David. David was partnering with God. They had a relationship, a relationship, not a religion, a relationship. David was not a religious man. He was a man partnered with God who was always before him and at his right hand. David knew that because God was at his right hand, that because the Lord was before him, he'd never be shaken. And that word shaken in the Hebrew means to waver, to slip or fall. Imagine if God's at your right hand and you, and you, you step on a slippery rock God's just going to go, whoa, man, that was terrible you fell like that. No, God was going to support him so he would never be shaken. By putting God first, where he belongs. Should God be second to anyone or anything? Read Isaiah 40. I don't think so. God isn't second to anything. He doesn't take a back seat to nothing. By putting God first, he had, now he has this personal experience and a relationship that couldn't be denied. Imagine someone telling David, there is no God. 
Really? Really? I killed a giant with a rock. And you're going to tell me there's no God. Okay. You go with that. I'm going, I'm believing what I believe in. That there is a God who's at my right hand. David had an experience, an encounter with God. Same holds true for us. As I said before, there's, there was nothing special about David. God made David special. <laughs> there was something special about God. So if we have an encounter with God, the arguments of others are useless against our experience. Someone could come and tell me, now someone could come and tell me that, you know, chocolate's bad for you. Yeah, okay. All right, I mean, I'll go with your opinion. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian, obviously, all right? Okay. But if someone came and tell me, you know, chocolate's horrible. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> no, no, I can prove it to you. Look at all the data I have saying that chocolate is horrible. Yeah, I've tasted it. We're going to send you to an indoctrination class, and we're going to, we're going to readjust your thinking about chocolate. And I could go through a 12-step program. I could come out and go, yeah, chocolate's good. Chocolate is good. No, no, it's horrible. We taught you it's horrible. We brainwashed you that it's horrible. No, you didn't. I, I tasted it. It's not horrible. It may be bad for me, but it's not horrible. It's really good. When you know, look, people can argue with you about God. I, I don't know what to tell you. He's real to me. He's real to me. I posted something on a reel about God's word and, and somebody came back, you know, with a comment that it's all fairy tales, bro. Right. And I just I politely responded back. What I love about God is he gives you the opportunity to make your own choices about him. I choose to believe his word's real. You could say you could say it's fairy tales. You could say it's all hogwash. OK, I've had an experience with God's word. It can't be denied can't be shaken. So their arguments are useful for themselves, but useless against my experience. When you know that 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 you know, that you know who can shake you? Who can shake you? Psalms chapter 1, verse 3, David says this. Because he delights in the Lord and he meditates on it day and night, because he rejects the counsel and the wisdom of the world. Okay, that's in a nutshell. Psalms 1, 2, and 3. David rejects the, the teachings and the counsel of the world. He delights in the word of the Lord, which he meditates on day and night. And because of all that, the result is this. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Don't you want to prosper in life? John said in John chapter, uh, uh, book three, John, third John, verse two, he said this, beloved, and I, I'd say this, I, I would, I, would I, I know I'm, I'm quoting what John said in the word, but I'm speaking this to you as well. Beloved, because you're my beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, or according to the prospering of your soul, your spiritual life. That takes precedence. God has great counsel for us, but we have to want his counsel and then do what he says. And the results? be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. Fruitful life, prosperous life, a good life. God bless you. Thanks for being a part of today's message. Let's, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you today and I thank you for your word. You've counseled me. You've counseled me, Lord. And I, I want to ask you to forgive me for the times I've ignored your counsel. 
the times that I've shut you out of my decision making and just gone my own way. And there's been there's been more than once that that's happened, Lord. You know, every time that I've done that and you've forgiven me for all of it and you continue and and continue to desire to work with me and to partner with me, which is just astounding, Lord. But you're astounding. You're amazing. I love you, Lord. And I just pray that uh, that you would speak to each one of us about our lives, because the trajectory of our life. I want it resting in your hands, not mine. I want it resting in your hands, not the words of others. I want the trajectory of my life to be in accordance with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a terrific day.